This is a special episode of Revolution at Sea with John Curtis Perry. Today, we present a conversation with Sung Yoon Lee, author of a recently published book on Kim Yo Jong, the sister of Kim Jong Un. She is cold, calculating, and vicious. She is the most trusted and closest deputy of the Supreme Leader of North Korea. She has intimated that she, too, has her finger on the nuclear button. Dr. Lee is a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center, a Washington, D.C. global affairs think tank. He is an expert on North Korea. He has worked at multiple universities, including Tufts University, Harvard University, and Seoul National University. In this episode, Dr. Lee is interviewed by John Curtis Perry, Professor Emeritus of History at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and former PhD advisor to Sung Yoon Lee. Some of you have listened to Revolution at Sea, the story of the rise of oceanic states. Today, we are moving to an opposite to learn about North Korea, which does not lead up to its official name, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, not a democracy, nor a republic. It is a closed totalitarian state in the tenacious grip of a ruthless family dynasty. Some years ago, when I visited North Korea, I stopped in China to call on our ambassador. He told me that if anything went wrong during my visit to North Korea, there was nothing that he or anyone else could do to help me. Have a nice trip, he said as I left. Now I have the splendid opportunity to introduce a leading American authority on North Korea who will tell us about his new book. Sung Yun Lee is a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Previously, he taught Korean history at the Fletcher School, Tufts University. He has written on the politics of the Korean Peninsula for numerous publications, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. He has testified as an expert witness at the U.S. House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Committee hearings on North Korea policy. He has advised senior leaders, including the President of the United States. Dr. Lee is the author of The Sister, The Extraordinary Story of Kim Yo-jong, North Korea's Most Powerful Woman. It was published by Pan Macmillan in the United Kingdom in June and by Public Affairs in the United States and Canada in September under the subtitle, North Korea's Kim Yo-jong, The Most Dangerous Woman in the World. I will cite a sampling of the reviews his book is receiving from Sir John Scarlett, former chief of the Secret Intelligence Service of Great Britain, MI6. In explaining the rise to power of Kim Yo-jong, Lee displays his deep knowledge and understanding of North Korea's extreme, ruthless, and self-obsessed dynastic autocracy. Not a reassuring story. From Stephen E. Began, former United States Special Representative for North Korea and Deputy Secretary of State, an extraordinary, well-researched, invaluable resource for understanding one of the most intriguing and least known figures in today's North Korea. From Max Boot, 
Washington Post columnist and senior fellow, Council on Foreign Relations. With great literary flair, Lee delivers an incisive portrayal of North Korea's princess. The sister is essential reading. The book will be translated into many languages, including German, Finnish, Hungarian, and Czech. And Dr. Lee's German publisher, Hoffmann Kampa, is billing it as one of the best five books of 2023 and a contender for several best nonfiction awards. Now, it is my privilege to ask Professor Lee some questions. Yun, who is Kim Yo Jong? What is she? Why should the world care about her? Well, thank you very much for the very kind introduction and for this rare opportunity. Kim Yo Jong is the seventh and the youngest child of the former North Korean dictator Kim Jong Il. The North Korean dynasty is really, as you intimated in your kind introduction, a dynasty pretending to be a republic. North Korea is unique in so many ways that I often, tongue-in-cheek, say that North Korea is uniquely unique. My British Church of England elementary school grammar teacher would wince upon hearing this, but North Korea is really unique. North Korea operates like no other state in the post-1945 period. North Korea resorts to state-sponsored production and proliferation of illicit drugs like a giant criminal syndicate. North Korea systematically counterfeits U.S. $100 bills and $50 bills, and this is quite unique for a nation-state, its weird criminal behavior. And the United Nations, in a monumental report in 2014, The Commission of Inquiry report on human rights in North Korea alleged that the nature, the scale, and the gravity of North Korea's manifold crimes against humanity reveal a state, quote, that has no parallel in the contemporary world, end quote. Thus far, I failed to answer your question. Who is Kim Yo-jong? Why does she matter? She matters because she is, in my judgment, the world's first and only nuclear despotess. What I'm trying to describe is, among the nine nuclear weapon states, I would argue that Kim Jong-un, the North Korean dictator, is the least restrained by checks and balances, that on his whim alone, the North Korean dictator is prone or is able to preemptively strike a peaceful neighbor with nuclear weapons. And since April 2022, Kim Yo-jong, on numerous occasions in written statements, has made that explicit threat against North Korea's peaceful neighbor, South Korea. Kim Yo-jong has said that, quote, by the authority invested in me, by Comrade Supreme Leader, her brother, and by the party, and by the state, that she is in charge of her nation's policy toward South Korea and the United States, that she has her finger on the proverbial nuclear button. This is unprecedented in history, and this has implications. The fact that we have a relatively young woman who has indeed her finger on the nuclear button has implications that favor mostly the North Korean state. Why? Because the latent tendency among many men and some women too, I would suggest, to patronize young women, to underestimate them, to think that they are, by virtue of their youth and gender, more malleable than men, works in North Korea's interest because although we've seen since 2019 North Korea going on on a missile 
barrage with more than 100 missiles fired in 2022 alone, there will come a time when North Korea systematically de-escalates and resorts to a post-provocation peace ploy, a pleasant outreach, dramatically changing the tone, the tune from molto agitato to placido. And she will be the face of her nation's diplomatic outreach, and she will once again convince the world that the nation means it this time. They're serious about denuclearization, rapprochement, reunification, peaceful coexistence, and all those good things. And therefore, she will play a major role, not only as the enforcer of North Korea's coercive policy today, but in the future also as the lead diplomat in North Korea's fake charm offensive. And her adversaries will be prone, I fear, once again, to patronize her, to underestimate her, and to want to believe that she means peace, when I think history points to the contrary, the opposite. They don't mean real peace. They mean to arm themselves so that they are better positioned to bully South Korea, a Korean state that is pleasant, that is rich, that is prosperous, and a magnet for the people of North Korea, with a view toward one day dominating the South, if not altogether taking over South Korean territory and its people. She is real. She is dangerous. Tell us more about the myth of the so-called Mount Pek to bloodline. Why is it important for policymakers to understand the nature of North Korea's ruling family and the internal dynamics in the Korean peninsula? Tell us more about their history. Well, as many people know, Mount Pekdu is a real mountain, a majestic mountain that straddles the border between North Korea and China. And in Korean mythology, Mount Pekdu is where the progenitor, the mythical figure, the progenitor of the Korean people was born atop Mount Pekdu. And once he reached maturity, the mythical figure, Tangun, took up his residence in Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea. Kim Il-sung has created this mythical narrative, some bold state lies as they are, that by operating out of a military camp as a small-time anti-Japanese resistance fighter in the 1930s, that Kim Il-sung in time grew his influence to liberate Korea almost single-handedly in 1945 by defeating the Japanese Empire, that he alone is the savior of the Korean people. There is no mention in North Korean historiography of the essential role of the United States in bringing Japan to its knees. There is just a very thin mention of the Soviet role in defeating Japan. Basically, it was Kim Il-sung alone that brought liberation and enlightenment to the people of North Korea. Now, with the second generational leader, Kim Il-sung's son, Kim Jong-il, this myth becomes more difficult to support. So what did they do? What did North Korea do? North Korea created this falsehood that Kim Jong-il was born atop this mythical mountain, sacred mountain, Mount Pekdu, in February 1942, and his majestic, auspicious birth was heralded by a double rainbow, a hitherto unseen sparrows, and so on, and the future great leader was born, when in fact... Kim Jong-il was born the previous year, in 1941, in a Soviet army barrack in the Russian Far East. Why? Because his father and mother served in the Soviet Far Eastern 
army. With the third generational leader, Kim Jong-un, this myth maintenance becomes even more challenging. Kim Jong-un is simply a princeling. He's had a very pampered, spoiled, luxurious life, as has his sister, Kim Yo-jong. For example, when the people of North Korea were dying, bodies piling up, corpses, all across the nation in the mid to late 1990s because of the Great Famine, which may have killed 10% of the North Korean population. Kim Jong-un and Kim Yo-jong and their brother, older brother Kim Jong-chol were living the good life, living in Switzerland, traveling by themselves with custodians, at times with their mother, skiing in the Alps, Disneyland, visits to Japan. They've led only the most luxurious, extravagant, and idolized life. They are very spoiled. So, for North Korea, the maintenance of this big lie, that heroic blood runs across generations of Kims, and that this sacred chapter, glorious chapter in Korean history, started with their grandfather in 1945 and continues to this day under the great leadership of Kim Jong-un, all this fake assertions, these fake assertions need to be maintained. They cannot be challenged. The cult of personality, the level of censorship, the level of the invasion of the private realm by the totalitarian state are all unprecedented in world history. What's also unprecedented and I think forever will remain unique to North Korea, is that North Korea is the world's first nation state, despite enjoying the tremendous advantages of industrialization, urbanization, and close to 100 literacy among its adult population, suffered a famine again. North Korea is the world's first country, an industrialized, urbanized, literate country to undergo a famine and probably forever, always, will remain the only country that enjoyed those tremendous economic advantages and experienced a famine. Well, the Mount Pektu bloodline is, to North Korea, a necessary front a false narrative that must be sustained. Now, national myths may unfold in a slightly illogical fashion, a non-linear narrative. They may sound like fables and not believable. But to the people of North Korea, this creation myth is sacred. It cannot be challenged. And I learned from a sage in graduate school that national myths are not to be dismissed easily. They may be nonlinear in the plot, but they say so much about the autonomy, the psychic energy of that people and how those people feel and believe about their special place, role, and mission for the future. So to the North Korean regime, the so-called Mount Pektu narrative mythology is essential. You warn that Kim Yo-jong in time will sing a different song. Her demeanor dramatically changes, as you pointed out. Standing in the forefront of her nation's charm offensive, engaging the United States and its allies, Can you give us a sampling of that behavior? And how should policymakers respond to her seemingly agreeable outreach? Well, you'll recall, of course, that Kim Yo-jong caused quite a stir sensation by visiting South Korea as the de facto lead delegate of the North Korean delegation to the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics that South Korea hosted in February 2018. 
This is the first visit by a personage of the Mount Pektu bloodline, so chimed many South Korean newspapers, the public. There was mass frenzy, fascination with this figure now stepping on South Korean soil. What did it mean? Well, the fact that Kim Jong-un sent his dear little sister to South Korea must mean that he means it, that he is quite earnest in wanting to improve relations with South Korea and reach out to other neighbors in the region, perhaps Japan, of course China and Russia, and in time even to the sworn enemy, as North Korea calls, the United States. So said many pundits, newscasters, former government officials. It was simply exciting to try to catch a view of this royal personage, the princess from Pyongyang, even if it were on the TV screen. From the moment her plane touched down at Incheon International Airport, the major international airport in South Korea, there was 24-hour full coverage of the North Korean delegation. All eyes were fixated on this young, mysterious woman. Look how pretty she is, commentators said on TV news networks. Look how she doesn't wear heavy makeup, but perhaps it's the heaviest eyeshadow that we've ever seen. What does that mean? It must mean that she takes this sacred mission of peace seriously. Look how modest, humble she is in her demeanor, at times deferring to the 90-year-old Kim Young-nam, who has been in government service for half a century. Everyone saw in her, it seemed, not quite literally, but it seemed as if all eyes were on Kim Yo-jong and those eyes were charmed by her modest makeup, no jewelry apparently visible, and her occasional Mona Lisa smirk smiles. She smiled a bit. She shook hands. She never said a word to the press, to the public. She showed up to meetings drank some wine, ate some food. That was it. And that evening of February 9th, 2018, at the opening ceremony of the Pyeongchang Olympics, curiously, she and her North Korean delegation were seated right behind and above the U.S. delegation, which was led by Vice President Mike Pence. Seated behind Mr. and Mrs. Pence, Kim Yo-jong exuded confidence. She knew that she was the star in the VIP royal box. She had her chin slightly up, her omnipresent smirk smile, quite visible, and she did not utter a word, did not shake hands with Vice President Mike Pence. In fact, the Pences looked at times a little displeased, grumpy even, refusing to clap even once when North Korean athletes and South Korean athletes together made their celebrated entrance. Now, the North Koreans didn't applaud, did not clap when the U.S. athletes made their entry either, so there was perhaps a little unforced error on her part. Can you imagine if Kim Yo-jong spontaneously applauded clapped as American athletes were making their entrance, and then in midair, as if she caught herself in an act of taboo, stopped applauding and adjusted her demeanor, belatedly realizing that she should comport herself with dignity and not show any affection for the Americans. The entire world would have wooed that, oh my God, she has a heart of gold, She means well. So there was an opportunity lost, perhaps, for this princess from Pyongyang. But her mere presence in South Korea created all these unreasonable, unrealistic expectations and illusions of a genuine, peaceful outreach by the North Korean dynasty. She deceives. She shows up. She smiles. 
and we all want to believe her, it seems. A few years later, she changed her tone to one that's quite unpleasant, oftentimes foul-mouthed, very sarcastically. She has denounced the South Korean president, both the current South Korean president and his predecessor. She has made fun of President Trump. She has used unkind words to refer to President Biden. And the effect is one of amusement, whereas if it had been her brother or a grumpy-looking North Korean male official who had uttered these vulgar words, I think the reaction would have been more one of indignation, whereas she gets a pass just by virtue of her gender, her youth, and her royal identity. How do you judge the past 30-year record of U.S. policy toward denuclearizing North Korea or those by its allies, including South Korea? Why has the anti-nuclear policy failed? What should we do about North Korea? I find it odd that the official phrase that has been used by North Korea, South Korea, the United States, and everyone else, including UN member states, to refer to this campaign to try to denuclearize North Korea over the past 30 years has been not the denuclearization of North Korea, but denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, as if there are nukes in the South. Once upon a time, there were. From 1958, the United States deployed hundreds of tactical U.S. nuclear weapons in South Korea, but withdrew all of them by consent between Washington and Seoul in 1991. So, when you say, Professor Perry, it's been an unrelenting failure, well, yes, sure, but there have been actually two successful campaigns of denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. The first was in the 70s when the United States caught wind of South Korea's secret nuclear weapons program and put enormous pressure on South Korea to dismantle it, to completely tear it down, even threatening to withdraw all U.S. troops from South Korea. So it was done. The second case of success in denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula, as I mentioned, was in 1991. The United States and its allies, including South Korea, perhaps exuberant, if not flush with victory, emerging from the Cold War victorious with the imminent collapse of the Soviet Union, thought it a reasonable concession for the United States to withdraw all U.S. nukes from South Korea and place their trust in North Korea that it would give up also its nuclear weapons program. The record, the scorecard, if you will, since then, over the past over 30 years, has been the following. North Korea a nuclear power, with at least 50 nuclear warheads today, probably more, many, many ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles that can hit every part of the continental United States, North Korea armed with submarine-launched ballistic missiles, intermediate-range ballistic missiles that can hit Guam in 14 minutes, that is a veritable nuclear armed state with also chemical weapons and biological weapons, whereas South Korea has no nuclear weapons at its disposal. So over the past over three decades, I think we can indeed say that this record is not stellar. It's been a total failure. Not only has North Korea come ahead with dozens of nuclear warheads, North Korea has also wrested away from 
its overwhelmingly richer, bigger adversaries, literally tens of billions of dollars worth of cash, food, fuel, and other blandishments. That's a victory for the DPRK and something to the contrary for Team USA. Yun, how do we explain this long, dismal record? What, what should we do about North Korea? Well, as I intimated a few minutes ago, take North Korea seriously and stop patronizing North Korea. We need to really address, change our attitudinal approach to North Korea, assuming that North Korea, by virtue of its small size and backwardness and weirdness, is a paranoid player that simply reacts to what the mighty United States does and says. As if North Korea has no agency. As if North Korea has no long-term strategy and is merely content to survive. Every weapon, including nuclear weapons, have both a defensive and offensive property. Even the lowly shield can be used as a weapon. Yes, of course, nuclear weapons bring enormous benefits in the defense of one's nation. But they come in also quite handy in making threats and in extorting a peaceful neighboring state in South Korea. The basic internal dynamic in the Korean peninsula is that of a pan-Korean contest, a contest for pan-Korean legitimacy. You have two Korean states vying for legitimacy. Each claims to be the sole legitimate Korean state representing the entire people of the Korean peninsula and adjacent islands. In this existential contest, I think much of the world would agree that South Korea is the winner. Nowhere else do you find such a huge income disparity between two neighboring states as in the Korean peninsula. South Korea is, conservatively speaking, 50 times richer than the North. Again, South Korea is an attractive destination, a magnet for the long-suffering people of North Korea. Can a deified leader who is infallible, who is semi-divine, as Kim Jong-un is said to be, can this person really resign himself to be forever the leader of the inferior, the loser Korean state? Perhaps yes, maybe not. Maybe what North Korea says, they're absolutely serious about it. What do they say? They say, as it's written in the Constitution, that, quote, the supreme national task of the DPRK and the Workers' Party of Korea is to complete the final Juche revolution, which North Korea defines as establishing the people's victory all throughout the land, which means the entire Korean peninsula, not just the territory under North Korea's control. So, we have to play the long game. We know that North Korea is a bellicose, hostile state, a state sponsor of international terrorism, a state that terrorizes its people, intentionally starves its people. How do we stand up to North Korea then? Well, don't be shy in raising human rights issues, in trying to send information into North Korea, in offering aid, demanding that North Korea allows NGO workers and other 
humanitarian aid workers to come into North Korea and distribute unmolested food aid and vaccine aid and medical aid. At the same time, send the firm message, the credible message to North Korea that the United States stands with the government and people of South Korea and of Japan, that the United States is committed to the defense of South Korea and its other key ally in the region, Japan, and that any North Korean adventurism will be met resolutely by the United States and its allies, and also double down on enforcing sanctions against North Korea's illicit activities. There is the widespread misperception that sanctions either never work or that they are something that one can turn on and off as if it were a light switch. Sanctions enforcement, like domestic law enforcement, is hard work. You have to allocate the manpower, the hours, the resources to investigate, to build up your case, and to punish criminals, illicit behavior by North Korea. And sanctions have to maintain over several years. Many people have said over the years that North Korea is the most heavily sanctioned nation on earth. Even a former U.S. president said so. It's simply not true. There was not even a single U.S. sanctions legislation until February 2016, and not a single U.N. sanctions resolution until 2006, some 10 years after the start of the famine in 1995. So today, U.S. sanctions vis-à-vis North Korea remain much weaker in kind, in numbers, than U.S. sanctions against Russia, Iran, Syria, and several other countries. So sanctions enforcement on North Korea must be sustained, and the United States and other democracies of the world must be given a reason, an incentive to do their part to try to slow down North Korea's nuclear development and other illicit activities by sanctions enforcement against the regime. All this takes time, and at the end of the day, in terms of compelling North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons, our efforts may fail. But at the very least, in doing our part, according to U.S. laws and international law, trying to slow down North Korea's rapid nuclear development is a worthy cause. Do you think Kim Yo-jong will be an effective negotiator in North Korea's efforts to gain sanctions relief? Oh yes, very much so. She's after all so charming. She can smile and she can put on a scowl and she can melt hearts and strike fear in her admirers. Seriously speaking, there have been reports as of May 2021, that Kim Yo-jong has been ordering the public execution of officials who get on her nerves. What is their alleged crime? They look at her funny. Poor posture. Too ambitious. They look at her another second too long. So the power to arbitrarily execute people is to play God, is the ultimate sign of uncontested power. Can this woman be serious when she puts on her charm and with a beaming smile re-engages the world? I don't have a foolproof answer to that question, but having observed Generations of Kims, for example, when Kim Il-sung, in the wake of a dramatic change in the international environment with National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger's visit to Beijing in July 1971 that paved the way for President Nixon's visit to China, the first ever 
by a sitting U.S. president the next February, what did Kim Il-sung do? This dramatic rapprochement between the United States and China, it freaked out a lot of people in the region, dependent states of both China and the United States. Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, North Korea, Taiwan was very concerned that the United States might sell Taiwan down the river. So what did Kim Il-sung do? Sit in his bunker and complain? No. He came out beaming, smiles, entertaining foreign visitors. For example, on May 26, 1972, Kim Il-sung sat down with two New York Times reporters, Harrison Salisbury, a noted former head of the Times Moscow Bureau, and John Lee, bureau chief in Japan, and they talked with Kim Il-sung for three hours. And Kim Il-sung came across as not only not crazy, but quite charming, self-effacing, very knowledgeable, humorous, and reasonable in explaining to the American visitors that Kim Il-sung has to please his constituents by his anti-U.S. rhetoric. That Kim Il-sung is eager to speak with the South Korean president and will not make a preconditional demand that the United States troops go home. The next month in June, Kim Il-sung met with a reporter from the Washington Post. The next month in July with a Harvard Law School professor and met throughout the year with over a dozen Japanese journalists. That was Rambo 1. It was a good film, like the first Rambo film, First Blood. When the South Korean President Kim Dae-jung visited North Korea in 2000, this was the first ever inter-Korean summit. It was a dramatic occasion, and many people believed that real peace was here at long last. Some years later, in 2007, when President Kim's successor, President Roh Myung-hun, visited Kim Jong-il again in Pyongyang in October 2007, many people wanted to believe at long last it's different, genuine peace is nigh. It happened again in 2018 under Kim Jong-un, just like his father, Kim Jong-il. For the first six years upon inheriting power, Kim Jong-il never met with a single world leader, never left his country, never made a foreign visit for the first six years of his rule. Just like his father, Kim Jong-un did the same. He acted in strange ways, met with a retired American professional basketball player called Dennis Rodman several times, but refused to sit down with a single world leader, never left his country for the first years of his rule upon inheriting his power in December 20. 11. And then what happened? Going back to the dad, in May 2000, Kim Jong-il pops up in Beijing. Why? Because he had an important summit meeting coming up. A South Korean president, the South Korean leader, was to visit in June. In July, for the very first time, Kim Jong-il, a North Korean leader, greeted, received the head of the former Soviet Union or Russia. President Vladimir Putin. A few months later, Kim Jong-il sent a special envoy to President Clinton, inviting Clinton to Pyongyang, and so on. And this is a replay of the same playbook by Kim Jong-un in 2018. He showed up in Beijing in March. Why? Because he had an important meeting with the South Korean President Moon Jae-in in April. Then he visited China again with his sister, not with his wife, but his sister, and met with President and Mrs. Xi in Dalian in northeastern China. And then, of course, the dramatic first ever summit meeting between the North Korean leader and a sitting U.S. president took place in June in Singapore, and so on. Thus, coming across as a reasonable leader, a responsible steward of his nuclear weapons, with whom we can do business. 
a dramatic image makeover. So let's remember history. Knowledge of history does not guarantee correct assessment of unfolding events today. But, if I may say so, ignorance of history virtually guarantees that we will fail, and the cost of failure can be enormous. Professor Lee, your book is receiving an excellent response, and we much look forward to your continuing work on the mechanics of dealing with this challenging problem that North Korea poses. We wish you great success, and thank you for meeting with us. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity and privilege. And as you know, I dedicate my humble book to you, Professor Perry, my mentor for life and the author of the forthcoming book, co-written with Professor Jeffrey Gresh of National Defense University, Taste and Trade. This has been a conversation between John Curtis Perry and Sung Yoon Lee, recorded on May 23, 2023 in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and published as a special episode of the Revolution at Sea podcast series in October 2020. This episode was recorded by Emily Games and 1623 Studios, with additional voicing by Jamie Rosenberg, and production and distribution by Albert buichade Foray. If you enjoyed this episode, and you haven't yet experienced the rest of Revolution at Sea, we invite you to check out the rest of the series where we explore the expansive human history of the ocean, from prehistoric Austronesia to modern China. Goodbye until next time. We make this recording freely available under the Creative Commons license Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International. Anyone is free to copy, distribute, and reuse this recording. Attribution to the original work is required, along with an indication of any material changes made to it.